welcome to the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number seven. And today, we're joined by Chad Sylvester, Vice President of Exodus Trail Cameras. We'll discuss what makes Exodus Trail Cameras different from their competitors, and Chad will share some tips on how to avoid camera theft and how to extend your battery life in your cameras. Also, Chad shares the story of his first ever deer harvest, and you won't want to miss it. All right, welcome back to the Truth from the Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. You're listening to episode number seven, and I'm your host, Clint Campbell. Today we're going to be talking with Chad Sylvester from Exodus Trail Cameras. Uh, looking forward to this conversation. I've met these, uh, met the, some of these guys uh, at the Harrisburg Great Outdoor Show this past year. Uh, really enjoyed the conversation that I had at their booth. Had been wanting to get them on the podcast for a while, so I'm glad that it finally came to fruition and we're able to uh, able to connect and, and share this information with you guys. I think that their company is one of those in the outdoor industry, especially post all of the Under Armour debacle that uh, a hunter can really get behind, feel good about supporting and uh, and, and, and spending some money with them uh, to help support their products and their, and their company overall. Uh, but before we jump into the conversation with Chad, I just want to take a quick second to thank all of you that continue to tune in uh, every other week when we put out these podcasts. As I'd mentioned in previous podcasts, and I'm, I'm sorry if I sound like a broken record here but every week the the downloads continue to go up um you guys are continuing to to tune in and and push the play button and and sit around and listen to either myself and phil talk about deer hunting or listen to us talk to folks other folks about deer hunting and uh, sometimes boggles my mind uh, that folks want to sit and listen to to phil and i talk about things that we we're absolutely passionate about and love to do and love to talk about and love to share with other people. So absolutely 100% thank you all for tuning in um, and look forward to hopefully having some of you on the show here in the not so distant future. But without further ado, we'll go ahead and get Chad on the line here and uh, talk about some Exodus trail cameras. All right, we're back. Uh, well, you're listening to episode number seven of the Truth from the Stand Deer Hunting Podcast, and I am joined by Chad Sylvester of Exodus Outdoor Gear. Uh, some of you may be more familiar with his company uh, known as Exodus Trail Cameras. How's it going, Chad? I'm doing great, Clint. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. I, I assume you made it home okay last evening from our, our phone conversation on the road. <laughs> Yeah, I made it home, home okay. Uh, it was an adventure, just to say the least. Yeah, yeah, and you had a, an adventure here like a week or so ago, didn't you? You guys were out in Missouri, if I'm not mistaken, doing some scouting. Uh, Matt was out in Missouri. Uh, he spent three or four days out there um, doing some stuff with the DeQuistos. Uh, but we were actually last weekend. Uh, we spent some time in the southern part of the state of Ohio doing some scouting uh, down on some big woods properties uh, that we hunt on, and uh, just trying to. I have some loose hands before the season, you know, uh, rearranging some cameras, uh, picking some final stand locations. Um, so yeah, we're just, uh, excited to kick, uh, kick our season off here in about 11 days. So it's, uh, it's coming fast. Yeah. I hear you. There's always that final push there toward the end of the season or the beginning of the season, rather the end of the off season to try to get everything in place. I've been kind of in the same boat. I know we were kind of talking about it a little bit yesterday when we chatted, I was in Ohio, uh, doing some scouting this past weekend as well. And, uh, definitely feeling the burn we actually open here on the eastern part of pennsylvania this weekend so i'm actually going to get my first stand time on saturday wow man that's awesome i was yeah i was under something that it was statewide october 1st but i guess i was wrong no they actually opened just a couple wildlife management units here on the eastern part of the state uh a little a little early and it actually runs a little a little later now truth be told obviously the deer aren't as as nice on this side of the state as they are on the western side of the state um, but I'll take the stand time anytime I can, uh, anytime I can get it. So I won't, I won't complain too much. Right on. Other than it's going to be hot. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> actually it'll remind me of November of last year. So, <laughs> so uh, I, hear you, man. I hear you. I know, I know, but I, I, we'll get into some deer hunting talk, you know, as, as we, as we go throughout, cause that's what we're here to do. But more importantly, what I want to do is kind of, you know, make sure we give uh, due diligence and due justice to what you guys are doing with Exodus Trail Cameras. Because, uh, you know, it's I, I ran into you guys at the Great Outdoor Show in Harrisburg. Um, you guys were actually right next to, to John Livingston, which was a nice little uh, uh, opportunity to kind of meet both of you at the same yeah. time, which was great. 
um, had a nice conversation and was really interested in what you guys were doing and honestly have been following you ever since through social media and your, your blog and your, your website and so on and so forth. So, um, but before we dive into the specifics of what you guys do and your, your offering and, and your products and, and such, uh, if you could just give us a little bit of detail, uh, background about yourself, you know, your hunting background, uh, professionally, you know, how you kind of came to be in terms of, uh, Exodus trail cameras. Yeah, Absolutely. So uh, I was actually born in Meadville, Pennsylvania, which is up in Crawford County, the northwest part of the state. Um, but luckily, I was raised in Northeast Ohio uh, on a family on a family farm, which is a dream setting for any whitetail hunter in the Midwest. Uh, yeah. you know, there's been several deer killed on that on that piece over 160 inches. So, wow. as you can imagine, being a being a young kid growing up uh, on on that type of property, um, you know, being in the woods as as a whitetail guy was almost second nature. Right. So that's really, I, you know, I started, uh, started hunting probably at the age of 12, 13 years old. Um, you know, everyone in my family, uh, all my family members were hunters, but it was more of a pastime leisurely activity for them, uh, which was, uh, r- really, I guess I kind of followed suit, uh, until about the age of 16, which, uh, there was a, a pretty significant event there that happened that kind of, uh, started this ob- obsession for me, uh, of going after mature deer. So, but we, right. I, we can talk about that here uh, a little bit later, but <clears throat> on after high school, uh, I took the opportunity to play collegiate football at uh, Youngstown state studied engineering there. Uh, after school was done at the age of 21, 22, uh, I really, you know, I having an entrepreneurial mindset, I knew I didn't want to go work for somebody else, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, <laughs> So through a network of friends, uh, I pursued a professional bull riding career in the PRCA for about seven years, um, which Whoa, then, so what, you're, what you're saying is you're not tough at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I have my fair share of uh, bumps and bruises <laughs> right. and a lot of scars in the face, but the, there's uh, that's a whole nother, whole nother side of me. But that's um, a whole different podcast we might have to get into. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> there's a lot of stories there, man. But, uh, you know, at the age of 27, 28, you know, if it doesn't in, in the rodeo world, if it doesn't happen by then, uh, you know, it's probably not going to happen. So I uh, humbly packed up my gear bag, stuck on shelf and, uh, you know, went to work for a, a civil construction engineering firm. Uh, I did that for a few years, spent a lot of time on the road again, and it wasn't very conducive to, you know, having a family, uh, being a family man. So I, uh, I took an office job for a telecommunications company, did that for a few years, and then eventually – uh, that's how I wound up uh, as co-founder, co-owner of Exodus Outdoor Gear, which is essentially right now Exodus Trail Cameras. Wow. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting path. I mean, it went from, you know, growing up on the family farm, which obviously makes 100% sense, you know, in terms of a whitetail hunter and, and, and what you do currently. Engineering makes sense, right? That's a, a, a very uh, detail-oriented and, and technology-driven kind of uh, background. And then, the, then you throw in some bull riding for good measure and uh, <laughs> <laughs> telecommunications, which kind of fits the, fits the mold for what you're currently doing and then into uh, Exodus trail camera. So that's quite the, uh, that's quite the path to, to Exodus. So you, you mentioned obviously, you know, your, um, your passion is, is, is going after mature bucks. You know, you kind of yeah. alluded to there for a mm-hmm. moment. Um, so speaking of that, uh, how was your 2015 hunting season? Did you, uh, did you harvest a, a, a nice one? Did you, you know, kind of follow suit with me, which was sweat in a tree stand for most of the time? But <laughs> I, uh, I had a tag for a second year in a row, okay. uh, which I hate saying, but it had its ups and downs. You know, it was my, uh, my second year hunting the big wood setting and probably some of the listeners and, or viewers uh, are thinking, what the heck am I doing, you know, hunting in the big woods when I have a piece of prime ag ground to hunt. Right. And, uh, I can answer that by three or four years ago, I had went on a DIY elk hunt um, on some public land in Colorado and really just fell in love with the Western culture, adventure style of hunting, being, uh, being in these remote areas where you were hiking in, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, sometimes more miles uh, every day and being in those areas that were still, you know, 100% wild. There was just something that, uh, something that felt right inside of me doing that. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the, at the end of that trip, uh, I came home, climbed back in the stand on the family farm, ended up killing a, a 167, uh, mainframe 10 point giant deer. But as I sat there, uh, you know, sitting in those small wood lots and pinch points, um, it just, 
it just almost felt as if I wasn't really accomplish, accomplishing much. I mean, I was still doing everything, playing the wind, running trail cameras, doing scouting. But truth be told, you know, you could you could take anybody off the street, give them a map, and if they sat there long enough, they were going to have an opportunity at a 140 plus. So, right. Uh, so that kind of that kind of steered me in the direction of wanting to evolve and test my skills as a hunter. Uh, so in 2014. Um, I, I eventually ended up on a big woods lease um, in southern Ohio, and uh, so 2015 was my second year, second year down there hunting the big woods. Um, you know, miles and miles and miles of unbroken timber. Um, so there's a lot, there, as you know, hunting the big woods. There's there is a significant learning curve um, hunting in the hill country and hunting big timber woods. But uh, I did have a couple encounters last year with uh, a 130, 135 ish type type buck uh in early november in one of those hot days you know right um, let let him walk due to uh some of the pictures we had on pictures of, of deer we had on camera uh you know i was kind of romantic about the about the idea of killing one of those giants that we had pictures of but um that didn't happen so i uh, humbly came home harvested a doe in the late season and uh that was about it nice so i mean it Maybe not a harvest, right? But the learnings you get from those types of experience that you carry into the next year, like that's oftentimes worth its weight in gold, at least in my, in my opinion. Um, you know, I, I know from, it's funny you mentioned elk hunting cause I've never done, um, an elk hunt, uh, backwoods or backcountry elk hunt. And I'm actually planning to go for my first one next year to Montana. Actually a couple of buddy, uh, buddies of mine are out there right now. Um, so that'll be my first encounter. I've hunted Alaska in the past, which was kind of, you know, what you're talking about where you get into these places where you know, I'm walking in places where no other human may have ever stepped before, which is right. s- surreal, you know? Yeah. So I totally get what you're saying where you kind of want that, uh, that challenge. And it feels like the further away you get and the deeper into the woods you get, you kind of almost become one with the the woods, you know? And it's like, you really kind of get that feeling. Absolutely. Um, and I think once that bug kind of bites you, uh, there's nothing else that'll, that'll kind of itch that scratch if you will. But yeah, yeah. I agree so, 100% man. <laughs> I know. Right. And I can understand the terrain you're talking about being in Ohio this past week. And I mean, the, that, the cover and the, the terrain you guys have down there is just un, unreal. Like I, one, I'd never seen cornfields that big before <laughs> in my life. Um, it was, it was insane. And then, you know, I, I hunt in Pennsylvania and on the Western side of the state and we have some Hills ridges, you know, some folks out West wouldn't call them mountains, but you know, they're, they're mountainous for this area, I guess you could say. Um, but just the type of cover and brush and briar that I experienced during my scouting this past weekend was nothing like I've ever encountered before. I mean, I'm pretty ripped up from, <laughs> from all the thorns. Yeah. Um, I may have to invest in some type of chaps in the future, but yep. you know, we'll, uh, we, we might have to hit the store for a set of those before I head back. But I want to d- dive into some uh, Exodus trail camera information here. And one of the questions I had, so you, you guys do things a little bit differently, and we'll get into kind of some of those details as, as we go. But what was that aha moment where, you know, usually companies that think differently, no matter what, you know, section or sector of business you're you're working in, when they do things, com- you know, completely differently than their competitors are doing, there's always usually this aha moment that kind of is huh. the the catalyst for that. So can you share with us and the listeners what that aha moment was for Exodus Trail Camera? Well, you know, if if you asked uh, Matt this question, he would probably have a different answer. We kind of have a different perspective on this. But uh, in my mind, um, you know, there wasn't really an aha moment. It was uh, it was really a process uh, of us being consumers running these cameras for 10 plus years, uh, and having them fail. So, uh, and being, being in a situation where, you know, the, in the past few years, you're five hours away from uh, your lease property or hunting, uh, the property that you're hunting. Um, you know, it's a pain in the butt when you go down and, and have these things fail. And it seemed like over the years, maybe I, I was running one brand and I didn't have luck with that brand. So the next year I would jump to a different brand and uh, it turned into this vigilant game of uh, Russian roulette, and uh, it never really got any better. You know, it really didn't matter what uh, what brand or model I was running. Um, you know, I could never get uh, consistent results, performance out of these things, and it really just felt like um, somebody could do a better job uh, without having you know a five or six hundred dollar price tag. So that's really um, how how the idea of Exodus kind of came to be. And from there, uh, it was just a whole lot of work, man. <laughs> just waking right. up in the morning, 
uh, nose to the grindstone, carrying a good attitude, and, uh, and and trying to accomplish a whole lot of work in a in a small amount of time. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's always, that's always the rush, right? It's, it's the, you know, especially once you have a great idea, you can't wait to get it in front of people. And so you Absolutely. Know, it's, it's probably one of those things too. And I don't want to speak for you, but you know, and just in talking to you and the folks that I met at the outdoor show, you guys are absolutely passionate, not only about, you know, Exodus truck camera and your, and your company, but also passionate about the industry as a whole and uh, deer hunting as a whole. Um, and just anytime I've spoke to you guys, whether it was via email or whether it was in person or on the phone, um, that that aspect of you guys came absolutely shining through, which is which is nice. You know, obviously, I don't necessarily want to get into the whole uh, Under Armour uh, debacle that that occurred, but it's always nice to have that <laughs> yeah. perspective from from companies who are doing good work that are actually committed to not just the industry but the hunters that they're they're supporting as well. Absolutely, I think. Yeah. Uh, you know this, and, and maybe this is a rare quality. Maybe it's not, and maybe it's good. Maybe it's bad. But we are deer hunters first, and we are business hunters second. <laughs> so right. sometimes there's a little bit of conflict there, but uh, we make right. it work. Right. So I mean, I know that you guys are, and I'll say relatively new, right? Because I mean, you're not you're not the new new kids on the block, so to speak. And, you know, I know you guys have been around for for a little bit of time. Um, but as far as the outdoor industry is concerned, you guys, as I'd mentioned before, are doing things just a, a little bit differently than, than your competitors are. Um, and I think some of these things are really setting you guys apart from the, you know, the, the normal, uh, brand names that people kind of gravitate toward when you're talking about tra- trail cameras. And I want to mm-hmm. kind of go through some of these things. And the first one I want to kind of tee up and it's at my absolute favorite. And I love that you guys named it the no bullshit warranty. So you can can you kind of give the listeners a little bit of perspective on what the no bullshit warranty and what, what all that entails? Yeah. So really when we found that Exodus, um, we wanted to solve the longevity issue with, with truck, truck cameras. And obviously it's a piece of electronic equipment that you leave out any elements 24 seven. Um, so it's a, it's a tough thing to accomplish, but, uh, we got away from the obsolescence mindset where manufacturers are producing or manufacturing products that, uh, are designed or engineered to just outlive their, their warranty. So if their warranty is 12 months, they're designed with a mindset that they're going to last or build them to last 14, 16 months because they know once that expires, then you'll be back to buy another, buy another camera. So that's kind of, uh, where, um, that was, that's kind of where all that started was getting away from that mindset and, uh, building a quality product that one, I was proud to put my name on. Um, you know, our names are tied very close to this brand and, uh, and, there was no way we were, you know, Matt and I would put out a product that uh, we weren't proud to proud to be a part of. So, the warranty basically entails um, whether it's day one, uh, year four, day three hundred and sixty. If that camera's not performing the way it is, the way it was when when you had first bought it, uh, we either repair it or, or we replace it. No 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 questions asked. Um, you know, there was an instance last last fall where. Uh, we had a we had a customer call in and he's having a problem with a camera. And it was the third week of October, you know, um, and and rather than you know having a long co- uh, phone conversation or um, correspondence through email, you know, we shipped him a new camera that day with a return label just to make sure he had that tool to use in the fall. So we're very serious about our customer service, um, very very serious about our service policies. So. On top of the so on top of the on the, the no BS warranty that's good for five years um, that covers any kind of manufacturing defect so anything that uh, that that's kind of out of your control as a consumer as a customer that falls on us as a as a business owner or a manufacturer is covered under that five year five year warranty so if your flash unit goes out it's covered if the LCD screen goes out um, based any, anything you can think of if the shell's cracked. Um, maybe there's a, there's a power issue and your camera's not turning on, you know, all of that stuff's covered. But on top of that, we offer a uh, 50% off theft and damage policy, which, um, you know, was kind of, kind of a hot topic, I guess, when we launched, there's a lot of people saying, well, how could you do that? How can you stay in business? These people are going to take advantage of that policy and uh, you guys are going to be around more than a year. And, um, and really that boils down to, you know that's that's valid once per original purchase, and um, that gives the gives our customers uh, the ability to replace the camera for for half the original purchase price or half the original retail full retail price. And really, in our eyes, um, you know, when when you have a camera hanging on a tree, you bought that for a specific reason, and it's meant to help. It's meant to be used as a tool to help you achieve your goals th- throughout the season. And 
Um, but if, if a bear chews on it or somebody comes by and steals that camera and walks away, there's a lot of other companies that see that as a, as a sales opportunity because they know you're up to creek without a paddle. Right. And uh, we see it in the exact opposite light. We see it as an opportunity opportunity to, to really take care of our customers and retain them for life, showing them uh, you know, that our bottom line isn't really about maximizing profits, but it's m- about maximizing uh, our relationships with our customers. I was just going to say that it's all about relationship building. It doesn't matter what, what you're doing. It's if you can create a long lasting relationship with somebody, um, especially in the business sector, there's, you know, there's, there's value there, but you guys being hunters more than anything, um, understand that importance between the gear that you use to hit the woods and how important it is to your potential success during the course of a season. And a lot of times these are not only are these, you know, successful, potentially successful harvests, but people are using your equipment to help make memories, right? So what Abs- about, you know, absolutely. that father and that, that son that's going out to, on a hunting trip, um, and they've been scouting, you know, a certain buck and that's the, the, the buck that, that, you know, that guy's son harvests for the first time. It's like, that's a big deal. And you played a part in that. Um, absolutely. So I love here, I love hearing, you know, how supportive you guys are of your, of your customers and are in the relationship business. Cause I think there's a lot of brands that are in the, uh, or in the making money business versus, you know, um, making relationships and helping people make memories. So it's always nice to hear from the good guys once in a while. But, you know, as far as your, your warranty and, and stuff goes, like one thing that kind of boggled my mind was how do you make a product, one, that can stand up to that type of warranty, right? Because mm-hmm. you have to have, because like you mentioned, it's like companies build products with the intent to, you know, to know that they're going to fail at a certain spe- specific point in time. I Absolutely. remember having a statistics course in college that we actually went through and um, the professor I had actually worked in, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was uh, research and development, but that was kind of what his job was, was to determine what the break point was. So how long they would be producing right. or how long the policy would last or a warranty would last. Yeah. Um, so one, how do you guys make a product that stands up to that? And two, what type of rigor? Because I imagine the, the the abuse you guys put these through in terms of testing and stuff has to be kind of insane to make sure that it's going to stand up to that test. Yeah. Uh, you know, really from the start, um, through our testing, testing, I guess really from consum- from a consumer standpoint, being customers and running these things for 10 plus years, we found um, that the biggest problem with trail cameras was water and grass. And mm-hmm. uh, through our testing as Exodus Outdoor Gear, as a trail camera company, we found that the traditional clamshell type design of a camera to where, you know, you have a hinge on one side and a single latch on the other. Uh, you open that thing up and you can see your little silicone or rubber O-ring and your batteries are exposed, etc. cetera. Um, so eliminating water ingress was, uh, was the number one thing, um, that we wanted to, uh, kind of hold to a minimum or, or try to eliminate. And you're never going to eliminate all of it. Um, but you can absolutely minimize it. So that was number one. Uh, number two was using conformal coatings on all of our components to where if there was moisture and if there is moisture getting inside your camera, uh, you know, that PCB board isn't going to be fried, uh, when, when there is a little bit of moisture in there, you know, you could, um, we've had cameras, we've, we've ran cameras through dunk tests and, and, uh, moisture ingress tests. And, uh, there was actually a funny story, one specific camera that, uh, we had dunked underwater for, for 30 seconds for like 10, 11 plus times. I can't, I, I have the data somewhere. I don't know the exact number, but the camera was sopping wet. I mean, there was actually water coming out of the battery tray after the last <laughs> time we dunked it. That camera is still on a tree. We used it the entire season last year. It is still on a tree to this day taking pictures. So the conformal coatings are a very big deal. But, you know, I mentioned uh, the obsolescence mindset. And, and as you uh, kind of touched on there, um, we're able to put more money into our components, uh, mm-hmm. buying components that have a longer lifespan or life cycle. Um, so that's really what it boils down to being able to not be under the thumb of those retail stores, being able to put more money into our components, um, you know, that have a 66, 68, 69 month, uh, lifespan. And then coupling that with the conformal coatings and then also the shell design of our camera. You know, we, we got away from the clamshell design, went to a vertical hinge with a double latch system to help eliminate moisture ingress and, uh, you know, there's a little more upfront. Um, there's a little. There was more upfront cost um, going with that type of design versus the traditional clamshell, as far as tooling and, and moldings are concerned. And uh, you know, when you look at a traditional clamshell camera, there's really 
um, there's really three pieces to that, excluding the latches. So you have your, your back where your batteries are, you have your front, and then there's an interior portion where the components in your chipset, your board, board lie. So we went, uh, we went a different route. We actually have seven pieces of tooling, so it was much more expensive to get started. Um, but in, at the end of the day, you end up with a much better product. Nice. I mean, it's, it's, you guys are really leaving no stone unturned when it comes to making a quality product. Like everything from the, the research you guys did just from your hunting experience alone to dunking a, a camera into uh, water uh, for <laughs> submerging it completely and then continuing to use it. Um, and then putting the money, you know, into the, the components that are going to make sure that your cameras are staying the test of time. It's like, this is all speaks to a company who is focused on delivering for their consumer. Cause you know, most places are outsourcing as much as they can possibly outsource and get the cheapest components they can possibly get to make sure that their bottom line is, right. is secure and the most important thing to them. Um, and everything right. I'm hearing from you guys is, is customer focused, um, yeah. and, and building that relationship. So again, that's just refreshing to hear. Um, especially in the technology world where we kind of assume those things are throwaway, um, one-time use kind of commodities. Yep. Um, so you had mentioned previously, um, just a couple minutes ago when you were talking about the, the gentleman who had his camera stolen during the course of the season. And I wanted to kind of touch on your, your customer service. So say someone, you know, gets a, an Exodus trail camera, gets the, the lift camera and, um, is struggling to set it up, you know, and I know you mentioned the, the theft, the theft example, or just has questions about how to use it. What type of customer service do you guys provide in, in those instances and, and how available are you guys? Cause I see you guys in terms of response on, on social media and stuff, you guys are on top of it. If someone has a question, I see immediate responses from you guys. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, we, you know, we have a different approach to customer service. We don't use a call center. Um, that's not outsourced, uh, overseas anywhere. We actually handle 100% of the calls in-house uh, right now with one of the one of the three founders of Exodus, um, and we are just about available 24/7. And a lot of people would think that's crazy, but uh, we've had people call you know between 11, 12 o'clock at night, uh, Eastern Standard Time, and uh, you know if we're up, we answer the phones. That's that's the bottom line, and we're able to do that through uh, a unique platform that uh, forwards um, not only calls, but also text messages to our personal phone. So if we're away from our desk, uh, we're out of the office, those calls are then relayed, uh, in a specific order to, uh, to one of our, one of our personal cell phones. So that is a, uh, a huge advantage for us. Um, so that's one thing. And then also, as you mentioned, um, we do a lot on, on our social platforms. We're very active, uh, not only with direct messages, but any kind of post or comment or anything on, on Facebook, Instagram, um, you know, we're, we're right there to, uh, interact and engage with, with everybody that has interest in our brand. Right. So do you guys have any, and I might just be asking for my own edification here, any tips? Uh, Cause I, I've recently run into some, some camera theft on one of my properties. Do you have any tips for, for folks to help reduce those things? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's, uh, there's always, there's always the obvious, you know, your Python cables, the lock boxes, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there, a lot of times the way we hunt, we don't like to carry those things with us. You know, we don't want really to be bothered with uh, carrying three or four bear boxes into the woods uh, in our packs or making sure we have keys to a Python cable if we want to move a camera. Um, so a lot of times what we do is uh, we carry a climbing stick with us and we'll get those cameras elevated uh, and hang them anywhere from eight, nine, ten feet off the ground. And then we're able to angle them down um, uh, to capture, you know, to frame up that shot the way we want. So by doing that, um, that really, uh, takes that camera out of the line of sight of people. Um, much like you're hanging tree stands, you know, to, to harvest deer, you're taking those tree stands out of the line of sight of your, your prey. And we do the same thing with our cameras. And one thing I would note is, um, anytime, you know, if you're in a state that where it's legal to bait or, or uh, use mineral sites, mineral stations, or maybe a, a food plot, any, any type of that, uh, any, any setting like that, I would recommend either camouflaging your camera, hiding it, maybe using a, a stick and pick ground mount, getting it out of an obvious area where a trespasser would know there's a camera. Um, I think that's the biggest thing there. And uh, it's funny that you mentioned stolen cameras because, you know, talking, going to all these trade shows and talking to, uh, talking to different folks, you know, I think most people think that theft usually occurs on public land and you know in our uh in our minds after talking to all these all these different folks we find that more cameras are stolen on private than public because 
there's, you know, nosy neighbors or trespassers. They know they're not supposed to be on that piece of property and they walk past and all of a sudden they get their picture taken and they're like, oh, crap. So there's one or two <laughs> things I can either, you know, I cannot do anything and, uh, you know, maybe the landowner doesn't know me. Maybe he does. And I'm going to get a knock on my door later or I can either steal a card or I can take the camera. So um, just be cautious in, in those types of uh, those types of settings. And um, if at all possible, get that cam- camera elevated. Right. Yeah. Because, I mean, going to the private land, mine was stolen on private land. And it just seems like that's a, uh, um, a a beacon, especially if folks know that you're hunting it and see you there relatively frequently doing, you know, whether it's working on food plots. If you're putting that type of investment into your property, they can probably safely assume you're doing something with game cameras to track what's going on, yep. um, which kind of just makes a, your property a target to a degree. Yeah. So I, I, I've definitely learned my lesson this year because uh, we've had a, one stand stolen and a uh, and and a trail camera, which were right next to one another. So it was kind of a, a, a two for Tuesday for whomever got it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Right. Um, uh, so one of the things that I think you, you touched on just a minute ago, one of the things you touched on was, um, you know, headed to a property, you might live five hours away and you get there and you find out your, your, your camera's bunk. Um, you know, I've definitely had that happen to me because my hunting property is roughly three hours away from me. Um, and I've had a couple of trail cameras die, but I think when they die, it's, you know, you guys are doing something to change this MO where, you know, you I come to expect trail cameras are going to last about a year and they're going to die. Right. And you guys are kind of flipping the script on that. Yeah. Um, but these of course were, were different branded trail cameras and they, I, they, you know, a few of them had, had perished, which, you know, I kind of come to expect, but the one thing that is extremely frustrating is when you go and you have a camera and you know it's good and it's relatively new and you know that it's working yep. and for whatever reason it sucks the life out of the battery and it's been a mm-hmm. month since you've been back and you've got pictures up until about two weeks before you went back and you lost two weeks uh, yeah. worth of with a worth of camera data so you ca- can you talk a little bit about you know battery life how to extend the battery life and some tips that you know folks can take home with them to to help them with their their battery life and their cameras absolutely you know uh, most most folks typically use alkaline batteries and trail cameras and we strongly uh recommend lithium batteries and really the difference is uh you know alkaline batteries are a 1.5 volt battery so our camera is 12 volts so it takes eight batteries to power that camera but the importance uh or the diff the most important difference is is the difference in the way they cycle so an alkaline battery like i said starts at 1.5 volts but every time your camera takes a picture that voltage starts to decrease just a little bit and as it decreases, uh, when it gets down to somewhere around 60% of uh, the lifespan, um, you're going to start to see performance issues because the voltage is not uh, high enough to power the camera properly. So you'll start to see your flash range shrink up, the detection zone will shrink up, your trigger speed will start to slow down, and then eventually you're going you're gonna to start missing shots. So uh, on the other hand, using lithium batteries, they're a little, they run a little bit hotter. They start at 1.7 volts, and they, they cycle – um, flat at 1.7 volts, almost, almost until the moment that they die. So it's very similar to using like a, like a battery powered drill. You know, uh, you can, you can take a Dewalt or Makita, um, power drill or or battery operated drill, and you can run a thousand screws into a deck. And then all of a sudden in, in, in two screws, the battery's dead. So, um, you get a much longer, you get almost three times, uh, the lifespan out of a, a, a lithium battery, lithium double A versus an alkaline double A. So that's uh, one very important thing. And also, you get much better cold weather performance. Um, the, hmm. the alkaline batteries use a water-based electrode. So when you get down to those cold temperatures, um, you know, the chemical reactions uh, in the, inside of that alkaline battery start to slow down because that water is, you know, obviously, you know, at 32 degrees, water freezes. So right. when you get down to, you know, around zero, um, you'll, you'll, you're really going to start to see issues with the alkaline batteries. Whereas the lithium batteries, uh, use a, uh, a metal base or metallic base electrode. So they can withstand the much colder temperatures are rated down to negative 30, um, which typically anywhere in, you know, in, the, in North America, you could run, you might run into some issues if you're way up in the bush or in Alaska, but I'm definitely going to be safe at that temperature. I promise everyone that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For most, for most people, you know, um, minus 30 is a, a safe temperature, but there are some, uh, there are a few little tips I can give, uh, you know, to help extend that battery life. Um, if at all possible, run your camera on a lower, uh, a lower image size. You know, if you have the ability to run a, a two or th- a two, a five, uh, megapixel picture, um, keep that as low as low as possible. That's going to help, uh, uh, increase your battery life. 
also, you know, a lot of times guys want are running, you know, ultra high burst modes. Um, you know, in, in our camera, you can run a one to a nine shot burst. And, you know, we talk to guys that are running a five or six shot burst mode, maybe over a corn pile or a, a feeder or a bait station. And really there's, there's no reason for that. You're just, you're just drawing extra power out of, out of that, uh, out of that set of batteries. So those are, those are two big things. Um, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of variables when you talk about battery life, you know, um, how many pictures are you getting a day? How many pictures are you getting at night? Um, you know, that has the biggest, uh, the biggest, um, influence on, on battery life. And the one thing I will say, you know, when you're comparing, um, different models of trail cameras, or different brands, it's very important to know, um, uh, the voltage on that camera, whether it's a six volt or 12 volt camera, there's a lot of manufacturers, um, that, that use a six volt camera, but you're running 12 double A's to run a six volt camera. And if you do the math, you're actually putting two or three times the battery capacity in that camera. So they're running them in parallel or, uh, in a sequence where those batteries are alternating. Um, so you're, that's not when you're comparing battery life in, in that nature where you're, you know, maybe one camera is getting 6,000, uh, 6,000 pictures and the other one's only getting 4,000. You really have to look at, uh, look at how that camera's being powered and, and by how many batteries, the more, accurate way of, um, comparing to comparing battery life is actually your resting and, uh, power consumption currents. Um, you know, your resting current, your daytime current, and your nighttime current. And some of that stuff's available online. If, if you go, um, you know, I know trail cam pro does that. Um, there's also a few other, uh, a few other sites that provide that information. Most manufacturers will not give that to you. Um, hmm. if you call us, we do. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, and and you know, as far as battery life and, and and Exodus trail cameras are concerned, you know, we're not breaking any any uh, any any barriers or, or breaking any records there. Really, we're we're slightly above average um, on a set of alkaline batteries. You can expect anywhere from six to eight thousand photos on a set of alkaline batteries. If you're running lithiums, you're going to see anywhere from uh, eighteen to twenty two thousand. Again, uh, you know, there's a lot of variables in there. We've actually had a camera that, that uh, we've had twenty six thousand plus pictures on the set so wow that's uh that is a, a lot of pictures where was that at that was actually set up in, a, in the in the back of our shop um just you know running test and demo models early on uh right. trying to you know figure out exactly you can look at those resting currents and uh in the, in the power consumption currents but you you really need uh some real life information when you're talking to people because if you get too techy um you know right. there's some people that might not understand all, all the jargon so Right. Cause for me, for, for, you know, layman's terms, it's like, I'm looking to see just how, how many pictures am I going to be able to take? And then I can kind of usually guess where I have it on our property and say, all right, well, I usually get X amount of pictures here per week, roughly. So that means this battery set should last me until X, you know, X amount of exactly. months or, or what have you. Exactly. Um, Cause whenever I get into the voltage and stuff like that, it's uh that sometimes my plus and isn't so good. So the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I want to talk a little bit because I find this part of what you guys do really fascinating, your direct to consumer model, um, because, you know, one thing that in, intrigues me is whenever folks cut the cut the middleman out, because there's a there's a multitude of reasons that, you know, that one would want to do that one. You know, I think you guys have been very clear about wanting to make sure you pass on those types of savings to to your consumers. Mm -hmm. But for me, from, you know, working in technology, the, the portion of my uh, life that I've been able to. The one thing that I find that's really interesting is usually when those types of things happen, you get to kind of reinvest or dive a little bit more into research and development and like future product development and stuff like that. So what type of and I'm sure that you guys have been afforded more liberties in that realm because of not being chained or bound to any type of big box retail relationships. So can you kind of talk to a little bit? what the direct to consumer model has provided you guys in terms of research and development and, and pushing out, you know, potentially new products here in the, in the coming future. Um, and what that has meant for Exodus trail cameras. Yeah, really, uh, you know, being consumer direct is everything for Exodus. We would not be able to do what we do if we were in big box retail. And, you know, typically what happens is these, uh, these, you know, the big box retailers, come to these companies and say, you know, we'll put an order in for 50,000 cameras, 50,000 units, but you have to give them to us at, uh, you know, let's just say $50. Right. So 
all of a sudden they're trying to figure out, okay, how can I manufacture this camera for 20 or $25 and still be able to mark it up to make money at 50. And then, you know, typically that retail markups, uh, after the big box store buys them, it's anywhere from 40 to 50%. So, right. um, with us, it is at, as you mentioned, it is the exact opposite. We are not bound or held under the thumb of any retail store. So when we go into our R and D process, um, and, uh, we are not – we're building products based on we want to build them the best we can. Price price kind of goes out the window for us. I mean obviously they still have to be affordable uh, for people to buy so we can't price them um, you know, uh, out of people's wallets or out of their checkbooks. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're, we're building products that last and we want to build them to the best quality we, we possibly can um, with, with price going out the window. So um, – that's uh you know like i said before that's everything to us is being being able to be consumer direct and and not being held by the chains of those of those retail stores um and really what that allows us to truthfully what that allows us to do is also is work at our own pace you know um right. when these when these companies are signing contracts um there's there's a whole legality side of the industry that a lot of people are are unaware of but uh, uh, you know, we're not signing ourselves. Uh, we're not signing our, our souls away to the devil, so to speak. Um, you know, if, if we get five months into a project and if it's not right, you know, we go back and fix it. We're not, we're not forced to hit, uh, different milestones or product launches based on, uh, on, on legal, on legal contracts. And I think that's, um, that's another point to be, that maybe, you know, some folks don't realize, but, uh, when you get held into some of those contracts, there's uh, there's a lot of money to be lost there. Um, so we're able to do things that are at our own pace, make sure they're done correctly. Um, so those two things are probably the biggest uh, advantages of being consumer direct. And, and also it goes back to, to uh, the relationship thing. Uh, I know this really isn't part of the R and D process, but we're able to own those relationships with our, with our customers versus, um, you know, giving that margin to a box store and uh, allowing them to uh, own that relationship with a customer. So um, those things are a big deal to us. Uh, right. Because being in a store potentially too is one of those things where you're also re- relying on the relationship that they have with their customers, right? Which can be fickle because it's not only based on the product, your product that they're buying. It's It can potentially be based on different products that they're picking up at that store, which then provides, you know, or maybe gives them a bad taste in their mouth. And then they attribute it to your brand because you're also in that store and they happen to pick it up during the same purchase when they had a, a poor experience. So there's right. a lot of things there just from a brand perspective that could go awry. And you guys kind of hold all the keys of the car, so to speak in, in Absolutely. that regard. The Absolutely. other thing that's interesting too, is the size of some of these companies, as you were saying, not being held to a bureauc or not being held to, a uh, a contract right with these, mm-hmm. these big box retailers because you know if anyone has ever worked in any sizable company the one thing you know is like with that size comes a bureaucracy and then with yep. that bureaucracy equals an extended amount of time it takes to do things so you're always pressed up against uh deliverable dates which ultimately means in the end game corners are cut in order to meet timelines absolutely <laughs> you absolutely. know so that's one thing that you guys have i think that is significant if nothing else it's like you guys are able to work at your own pace and put out a quality product um, which I don't know that there's any other any competitors you guys have that could could say the same thing. Well, actually, uh, yeah, not having that corporate structure or the uh, bureaucracy, as, as you said, uh, leaves us to a lot of advantages. You know, when uh, we put our heads together and go through the R and D process, we don't have to. It's not a development team reporting to a project manager who then reports to you know his higher up and then his higher up and then finally something happens. You know. Uh, we move at a very rapid pace here because there's, you know, we are a small company um, and we are, all three of us are completely hands on and almost, uh, you know, we all have our daily roles, but uh, in the R&D process, we all, we all kind of collectively um, uh, go through the process together and bounce ideas back and forth, whether it's hardware, software, uh, mechanical design or whatnot. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. I, I know exactly what you're saying, and uh, that, that's, a, that's a huge advantage to us is not uh, not being stuck in the corporate world. Right. And then, of course, you guys can, you know, collectively, the three of you can take them out in the woods and beat them up and, and use them for your <laughs> for your hunting experiences, too, right? Which yes, isn't sir. a bad, which isn't a bad uh, perk of uh, working at Exodus Trail Camera. 
Um, so I want to shift gears here for a quick second. Uh, well, actually, before I shift gears, I want to ask one other follow up question about the R and D process. So with mm-hmm. the, with that re- research and development that's going on, is there any uh, peek behind the curtain? You know, I don't want you to feel like you have to divulge too much here, but is there anything yeah. that's coming up on the uh, on the horizon that you want to give everyone a heads up about? Yeah, there's uh, you know, we've gotten a lot of inquiries um, over 2016 with uh, you know when are we coming out with our sophomore release, and I think. Uh, you know, there's some some specs uh, on the lift, our debut camera that were, you know, it kind of got, you know, obviously the, the warranty and the longevity and the, and the issues, the, the really the foundation of Exodus caught a lot of people's attention. But, you know, having a 0.9 second trigger speed wasn't really good enough for a lot of people. You guys wanted to, uh, the guys that are spending $200 on a camera wanted to have something like, you know, 0.5 sub, you know, sub half second. Um, mm-hmm. So something that we've been working on uh for well, going on eight, seven, eight months now is uh, our sophomore lineup. So we are uh, we are nice. releasing a Gen two camera um, that will be in production uh, in January and probably available for purchase. Uh, our our target date is for the Harrisburg show in, in twenty sixteen. So early February, that'll be out. Um, there'll be a, a few other SKUs um, in that camera line. Uh, we are also working on an accessory line and, and a multitude of other other things. Um, you know, so the wireless game is very big right now. Um, right, that's in the back of our minds. Uh, we, we've we've started on a project back in uh, March of this year, and uh, really worked through uh, the, the writing the specifications, the proposal, um, the patent process, and then we we kind of had to pivot. Um, we kind of put that on hold. Um, there were some there were some barriers that we ran into that uh, we knew that we were, we were going to take some time to uh, to work around, and uh, you know it was one of those things where we wanted to focus on uh, uh, getting our sophomore release of of traditional standard cameras out, and then go back to the drawing board and work around those barriers for that wireless project. So there are some uh, we have some big things coming in 2017 that we're really excited about. Nice. Yeah, I look forward. I know we kind of touched base on it a little bit via email and just in our phone conversations. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what you guys have uh, going on here in 2017 um, and definitely will plan to be at the uh, the Harrisburg show to meet up with all you guys, too. Awesome. Um, and do a, a little maybe an after uh, after show celebratory beverage afterwards to celebrate the new sophomore launch even. Absolutely. Yes. So I, I do want to shift gears here really quickly um, because I know, you know, we've talked about your relationship with your with your your um, with your customers and how important that is to Exodus trail cameras and your, and your brand and not just your brand, but your company overall. So I've of course seen the testimonials on, on your website and I've seen, you know, some of the, the great things that folks have had to say on social media uh, about what you guys are doing and how you've helped them out, whether they were in a pinch or whether they had questions about how to operate the camera or whatever. You guys have kind of been there every step of the way for the folks who are engaging with your brand. The one question I have is, is there, is there, cause anything that you do, there always seems to be that pivotal moment or that moment that is kind of that, that this is why we do it moment. And I was just wondering mm-hmm. if there was anyone that reached out to you guys, whether it was this, just to say thank you or to say, Hey, you guys helped us out in this way, or just, you know, this is what your, you know, uh, product was able to help me achieve. Was there that one moment that you guys kind of sat back and was like, man, this is really why we do this. This is why we, you know, have the no BS warranty. This is why we put all the effort into the great components. This is why we take the time that we take to make sure we get it right. Yeah. You know, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's tough to, to pick a specific one. Um, as you mentioned, we, uh, we get a, a, a lot of, a lot of direct messages on Facebook, um, and comments on posts on our page and comments on Instagram with, you know, people just being really gratified with, uh, how they're spending their money and, and all the support that we've gotten, uh, since 2015, it's, it's really humbling. So it's tough to pick out one, but there is a, there is a guy down in North Carolina, um, Buster Haithcock, who, uh, actually had called us before we had even came to market. Um, and you know, was, was interested in the cameras, wanted to know some specifics, uh, really before we had released anything, you know, we, uh, kind of launched with a, a Facebook, uh, video that kind of went viral and it caught his attention. So he called us up and, uh, anyways, make a long story short, he, uh, he ended up purchasing a camera. And then later on that year, um, he actually bought several cameras, but those cameras led him uh, on a hunt with his daughter, and his daughter was able to harvest uh, harvest her first animal 
um, that year. So he had sent us in uh, a few pictures, harvest harvest photos of, of those two together and uh, seeing her face just kind of light up and, you know, him being even even prouder, you know, his chest was all bowed up and he was, right. he was super boastful and he was just super pumped. So that's, uh, that's definitely one, uh, testimonial that kind of, kind of stands out just because, uh, you know, the, the conversations that we've had with him, uh, from our launch. Right. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, it's interesting that he has a daughter cause I'm sitting here as you're kind of talking about talking through this, thinking about one, it took me back to some of the first hunts I had with my dad, right. And some mm-hmm. of those early um, days in the woods. And then I have a daughter who's, who's eight that, you know, some of the, our listeners have heard me talk about and I've gotten her into archery a little bit and she spent some time in a Turkey blind with me and helping someone make a memory with their kid like that is, I mean, if, if you guys aren't doing anything else and you're doing that, then I think you guys are winning all the way around. Absolutely. Sure. So before, one of the last things I always like to do is kind of go on a hunt with the folks that come on and, and, and spend some time with us just to kind of get a sense of, of, you know, what some of their experiences have been. So if we could, let's go on a hunt with Chad and give us every detail from the moment you step out of the truck to you get back to the tailgate and the stories that ensue around there and let us know where you're hunting. Well, I can, uh, I can take this either way. I can, I can take it, uh, the successful route or I can, I can talk about the many screw ups I've had over the past, <laughs> the past 10 years. Nice. Um, I'll go yeah, back. I have, to, I, have a, uh, I have a book. I have a book of those. In fact, <laughs> it's all, it's all, it's all part of the process, man. If, uh, yeah. if you haven't screwed up or blown a hunt or missed a deer or, or made a bad shot, uh, you're either lucky or you just haven't been doing it long enough. So, <laughs> right. Exactly. But, um, I'll go back to my very first buck that I killed on the, on our family farm. Um, I was 16 years old, uh, was not an archery hunter at the time I was gun hunting. And it was, uh, the, the last, it was the last Saturday of the season. So essentially it was the last day of, of gun season. And this was back in 1998. Um, and you know, we were all out in the woods and I had sat that morning and not seen anything. And we had went in for lunch and, uh, just really kind of being frustrated because I had, you know, had very, very minimal, um, uh, chances at a deer at that point, at that point in my career. Um, so my uncle and I kind of formulated a little strategy and said that we were going to drive this one block and, you know, he would walk the interior of the woods and I would walk down uh, the edge of this old railroad trestle. So we had our lunch headed back out to the woods and, uh, you know, we, we made a big loop to the West side of the property and, and started walking, uh, uh, which I guess it was East started walking, uh, in the opposite direction, um, you know, from thick, heavy cover out towards this open field. And, um, we were, we had been walking for like 40 minutes and, you know, I'm kind of, kind of daydreaming, whistling, thinking of, you know, girls or whatever I was thinking of at that time. And, <laughs> uh, I had gotten about, uh, about 50 yards from that field edge. And, uh, I just, I, I heard this wrestling or this, this, all this crunching and loud noise down in this, um, this hedge or this, this real thick swampy area that was just down below, uh, that train trestle or the train tracks. And it sounded like Hulk Hogan and Andre, Andre, the giant were going at it, man. It was like, it was incredible. <laughs> and so I kind of stopped and gathered myself for a second and outruns this giant. I mean, absolute non-typical points everywhere. And, uh, you know, he crossed, he crossed me perpendicularly at, uh, at like 15, 16 yards. And, wow. uh, he was coming up the bank on a, on a dead run and I shot once and, and it looked like he had kind of tripped or stumbled. It kind of went down in the front end. So I racked another shell and he got up and I shot again and he kept running. So I racked another one and shot again. And, uh, he ended up running across, you know, right out in front of me, crossed, uh, across the neighboring property out towards the road. And I'm like, I'm in a mad panic. I had no idea if I hit the deer or not. I mean, it happened so right. fast. It was over in like five seconds. So I'm, you know, dressed in all orange. I am sprinting across this field after this deer, <laughs> trying to, trying to load more shells in my shotgun, you know, and, and, uh, I get halfway across the field. I don't see the deer anymore. I'm like, Oh man, what the heck? What the heck? You know? And at that time I was on a neighboring property. So I turned around and went back and I'm like, all right, let's look for blood, you know? Right. So I get back to the railroad tracks and at this time my uncle had walked out towards the woods and he's like, Hey, I heard you shoot, you know, did you get him? Where's he at? You know, what happened? So I tell him the story and, uh, you know, now he's all excited and, and we're looking for blood and uh, we can't find blood anywhere. So we walk out into the field, um, you know, eyes to the ground, kind of, uh, trying to get on a blood trail here. And, uh, we hear this whistle. 
So I look up and there's this guy standing out in the road waving his hands and, and he's yelling, hey, he's, he's up here, he's up here. So uh, we go walking across the property and uh, literally right in the ditch is laying um, 177 inch deer and 20 scoreable points. Whoa. That I had, that, yeah, it was unbelievable. It was, uh, it was unbelievable. And uh, I hit him with my first shot. So he went about um, about 150 yards, and then he, uh, you know, he crashed over in that ditch. And uh, you know, there were people driving by, and the cars were stopping, and everybody was, you know, giving me high fives and going nuts. And it was, uh, it was just a surreal experience at the, at that age. To, you know, truthfully, that was it was complete luck. I mean, we had no idea that deer was there. I mean, right. uh, after talking to some of the neighbors, they had. Uh, they had, you know, spotted him glassing in, in some of the bean fields that they knew he was there, but it right. was just, uh, it was total luck. But in hindsight, that's really uh, that's really what got me to where I am today. Was you know being in that situation, putting my hands on that animal, and uh, instantly uh, becoming obsessed with uh, mature deer. Wow. Yeah. So w- was that your f- was that your first buck, or was that? That was my very first deer period. <laughs> my very first deer ever, ever. Oh man, that's that's insane. Have, so th- the question is: is have you matched that score at any point since? No, I have. Wow, not. yeah, because that's like that's like almost a once in a lifetime type of deer. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like even for like places that have great deer, that's that's a that's a huge deer. Absolutely, it's you know uh, at at the time. You know, everyone was everyone was telling me, "Well, you just better put that gun up and and sit on the front porch in a rocking chair because that's never going to happen again." Right, you're going to be telling that story for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it was it was awesome. Um, you know, the newspaper did a small write up on you know this young hunter, you know, killing this giant deer, and um, I've killed some big deer, uh, not I, you know, still not to the day of that caliber. I've I, I have uh, I have a deer kill that's 167, as I mentioned, and then. After those two, it drops off pretty fast. <laughs> right. <laughs> nice. I'm guessing you've got that one mounted somewhere, right? Oh, there. Yeah, I got uh, I got a few of them up in the wall in the office inside the house. So nice, it's, uh, nice, nice. So I, <laughs> I think with that, I think that's like the perfect way to to end because that's such a great story with the successful hunt and the fact that that was the first deer ever that that you killed. I think the first one I killed, my dad shot it. He was like, "Is it a buck?" I was like, "Yeah, can't you see his antlers?" He's like, "I'm not sure I can get a keychain around that thing." So <laughs> that was my first one. My uncle was like, man, I don't know how you saw that thing. But, um, but nonetheless, it was, a it was a, a, a trophy nonetheless for me at that, at that age. Um, but before we go, can you just kind of give folks a heads up as to where they can find out more about, you know, presently the lift camera that you guys have out on the market and, uh, where they can, might be able to find, uh, find you on social media and anywhere they can get any more information about access trail cameras. Absolutely. So, our website is uh, www.exodusoutdoorgear.com. Um, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash Exodus Trail Cameras and then uh, uh, on Instagram at Exodus Trail Cameras. So any, uh, any one of those platforms, we are readily available. Um, if, you, if there's any questions, feel free to reach out uh, via email, phone, um, direct message on Facebook, Instagram, uh, whatever is convenient for you guys. Uh, we're, here to, we're here to help and answer questions. Awesome. Well, hey, Chad, thanks for, for hopping on. I know we this has kind of been uh, you know in the works for a little while. I'm glad we could make time to, to connect and, and chat. And I'm really looking forward to what you guys have coming out next year and definitely want to connect with you guys when we get to, uh, the, uh, to, to the winter here when the uh, Harrisburg show rolls around. But I do appreciate your time and uh, nothing but the best and success for you guys. Absolutely. Hey. Thanks for that, man. We, uh, you know, we really appreciate, uh, your support, all the support from the industry and, uh, all the, all the blessed feedback we've gotten from consumers. So we're, uh, we're really humbled in what we're doing. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be on the podcast. Uh, we think you're doing good things. So, um, just glad to be a part of it. Awesome. Thanks. I appreciate it, man. All right. We'll see you. All right, that's a wrap for the show for today, folks. Thanks for tuning in. We want to thank Chad for joining the podcast. If you are enjoying the podcast, if you would be so kind as to leave us a five-star rating on iTunes, we'd be very much appreciative. And as always, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. Feel free to share with friends and family who may like the podcast. And until next time, we'll see you. (laughs) 